continue our program. Uh, and this is the final academic session now, and the title of the session is Education. So we have two speakers from the Sibelius Academy, the Department of Music Education there. And our first speaker is Laura Mietin, who's a doctoral researcher there, and has been working with the, uh, well, Complex context. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say the complex context, which is always very intriguing and nice and thought provoking. So, uh, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to be here. Um, yes, uh, so uh, this presentation and the topic is um, part of my uh, doctoral study. So, first, I would like to say a few m words about that as a whole uh, in order to give background to the case that I will be discussing here today. So, um, the working title of my doctoral dissertation is uh, Co-Creating Visions of Intercultural Music Teacher Education in Finland and Israel. And this is an institutional collaborative project between the music teacher education programs at the Sibelius Academy and the Levinsky College of Education in Tel Aviv, Israel. And this study is based on a mutual institutional interest in developing music teacher education through research. Uh, using the concepts of a mobilizing network and a networked expertise as theoretical starting points, this study includes a transformational vision of what a future learning institution would look like uh, if its practices were based more strongly on cooperation uh, networking, participation, and sharing. The data is generated by conducting focus group and individual interviews and facilitating workshops with music teacher educators in both programs. The study is a form of uh, developmental practitioner research which aims to co-create knowledge and future visions for more collaborative and interculturally competent music teacher education. Here are the research questions of my study, and uh, in this presentation I'm going to address the second one on identity construction and intercultural competencies of music teacher educators. So first a couple of words uh, about Israel's education system. It has four parallel educational streams, state secular Jewish, state religious, that is traditional Orthodox Jewish, state Arabic and state-funded independent schools, that is Jewish ultra-Orthodox and Arabic language Muslim and Christian religious schools. The Levinsky College of Education belongs to the state secular Jewish stream. The students' curriculum is connected to the K-12 state secular Jewish curricula, and the School of Music Education at Levinsky College of, Teacher Educa uh, College of Education offers a four-year bachelor program in music e uh, education. So this certifies graduates to teach K-12 at Hebrew-speaking state educa educational institutes. And two new programs have been developed at Levinsky in the last 10 years. A special program for Jewish ultra-Orthodox female students and a joint program with an academic college in the north of the country where most of the students are Israeli-Palestinians. And then the case. Um, the protagonist of this case is a Jewish Orthodox music teacher educator who is teaching at Levinsky. I will call her Rachel. Rachel teaches musicology and music education subjects in the main Tel Aviv program in the Special Program for Ultra-Orthodox Women in Jerusalem and in the Safed Program for the Israeli Palestinians. Rachel's religious background is in Orthodox Judaism, an approach to Judaism that includes modern Orthodox Judaism um, and ultra-Orthodox or Haredi Judaism. But, but in, twi in between these two poles, there, there is a wide range of philosophies, philosophies and levels of religious stringency. Modern Orthodox Jews, the, the religious outlook that Rachel identifies herself with, uh, and ultra-Orthodox Jews, 
share the observant view on the interpretation and application of the laws and ethics of the Torah. However, ultra-Orthodox Judaism is generally understood as the most conservative stream of Orthodox Judaism. During our first round focus group interviews with the teacher educators of Levinsky, Rachel's accounts on her current teaching job at the ultra-Orthodox Women's Program combined with her own religious background and views on music education caught my interest and I decided to interview her individually about these topics. And I have conducted two interviews with her uh, and uh, the findings uh, from the dates that they are discussed here today. A little bit more about the ultra-Orthodox Jews. The ultra-Orthodox Jews belong to the religious stream of Haredi Judaism that is not an institutionally cohesive or homogeneous group. Instead, the communities that identify themselves as ultra-Orthodox differ from one another in the degree of stringency in religious practice and rules, such as dress code, modesty and isolation from the surrounding society and culture. In the ultra-Orthodox communities, the segregation of the sexes is a rule. Girls and boys go to the separate schools. As grown-ups, women are often expected to work outside the home, while men are encouraged to study holy scriptures at religious colleges within the community. Ultra-Orthodox women are often the sole breadwinners in the family. They are also the ones who seek vocational training in order to land jobs. In their community, teaching is seen as a traditionally female vocation, and thus um, many of the ultra-Orthodox women trained to be teachers. Teaching music, however, is a trickier question for the ultra-Orthodox, since music as a subject has to do with emotions and performing. There are many restrictions when it comes to teaching and performing music among the ultra-Orthodox. For instance, women are not allowed to sing in the presence of men. There are also strict rules on repertoire. Listening to any kind of Western church music or vocal music is strictly forbidden as is contemporary Western popular music. Despite these musical restrictions, being a music teacher is an accepted career choice for women within the ultra-Orthodox community. In this presentation, I use theoretical reading analysis as a method of analyzing the data. In, the in theoretical reading analysis, the researcher uses theory as a looking glass through which she analyzes and inter interprets the data. For this purpose, I have chosen Zygmunt Bauman's notion of liquid identity and Sanne F. Ackermann's and Arthur Bakke's theorization of boundary crossing as the theoretical lenses through which I read and interpret the data. Bauman makes a distinction between the modern and postmodern societal order, calling the former solid modernity and the latter liquid modernity, according to their characteristics. According to Bauman, in the present liquid modern times, an individual does not possess only one monolithic fixed identity that is unchangeable from birth, but rather one is constantly reconstructing her or his identity through identification that happens over and over again in time. Bauman's notions of liquid identity and identification uh, refer, re, um, refer to the crossing of different identity markers, such as gender, age, class, nationality, ethnicity, and religion across time and place. This intersectionality of different identity markers creates a constant flow of identities where the individual's adherence to the particular identity markers at the particular time depend also on the prevailing circumstances and the interaction with others. In the analysis of this case, such intersectionality can be seen as an essential part of boundary crossing, that is, and I quote, a person's transitions and interactions across different sites, end of quote. And next I will present the preliminary findings of the theoretical reading analysis uh, that I have conducted. In the interview situation, Rachel is an outspoken, verbally versatile speaker. When I ask her to describe herself as a music teacher educator, 
In relation to the ultra-Orthodox female students, she comes up with the following qualities and statements. I'm a feminist and a liberal. I'm an observant Orthodox Jew. My pedagogy is postmodern. I do not come with answers. I like to break traditions. I am not always right. I am an insider-outsider. Since she grew up in an Orthodox Jewish community in Jerusalem, she knows the nuances and the language of the ultra-Orthodox community. I come with dialogue. I negotiate using humor. I'm a facilitator. With these statements, she draws a picture of her sense of her own identity and position among the ultra-Orthodox students. Many of these qualities clash with the religious and moral principles of the ultra-Orthodox community. For instance, by identifying herself as a feminist and a liberal, she is deliberately stepping out of the strictly traditional and conservative outlook of the community. Furthermore, breaking traditions, asking questions instead of prov providing answers, and admitting that she is fallible as a teacher will shake the authoritarian status of a teacher assumed by the community. Here she compares her own religious and moral outlook to the ultra-Orthodox doctrine. I'm very postmodern in my Judaism, which means that I allow much of my religion to go through myself as authority and less dependent on structured society authority. I don't have to ask a rabbi everything that I do. I have my own kind of criteria and my own independent dialogue with God. Now these women who are in their society where it's about social roles and women are not supposed to a certain extent have a direct dialogue with God. It's supposed to go through their husbands. I can be a threat to that kind of society. Their values are more black and white. So even simple, simple things like pedagogy. My pedagogy is postmodern. I do not come with answers. They've never experienced that before. You know, the teacher has the answers. The strict religious rules and norms of the ultra-Orthodox community influence community members' everyday actions and interactions. Rachel feels that she has to narrow, to narrow down her identity in various ways in order to be able to teach the class. Her appearance and her, her, and her way of speaking are the visible and audible ways of signaling assimilation. When entering the Jerusalem campus, she has to obey the modesty rules of ultra-Orthodox women by wearing a long skirt, a shirt that covers her arms and neckline, and a head, headscarf covering her hair. She tells me that this makes her very uncomfortable, and she does it very reluctantly. It is also with some phrases that she uses, by default, that make her, her restrict her natural self-expression. For instance, certain religious phrases that are common to use in the Orthodox Jewish setting, but not acceptable in the ultra-Orthodox context. In the course of five years as a teacher in the program, Rachel has learned sensitivity in recognizing the lines that cannot be crossed in terms of discussed topics, acceptable musical repertoire, and her own self-expression and behavior. She respects the ultra-Orthodox authority, but at the same time wants to challenge the students to think differently within the limits. Ackerman and Bakker refer to boundary crossing as motion that takes place in between two activity systems that have potentially similar interests, but each have different cultures. In this case, Rachel and the ultra-Orthodox female students both, both share an interest to teach and learn music and music education, but differ in their cultural backgrounds. According to Ackerman and Bakker, and I quote, the boundary in the middle of two activity systems thus represents the cultural difference and the potential difficulty of action and interaction across these systems, but also represents the potential value of establishing communication and collaboration." End of quote. Rachel herself identifies this potential as a grey area, or a borderline where she can be playful and experimental, but at the same time she has to be very careful in recognizing the limits and in knowing where the red line is.
She has to sense when she cannot go further without crossing the line, and in that way visibly rebel or contest the prevailing societal no order. She sometimes stumbles, for instance, at one time in class she accidentally started playing a CD with a vocal version of a classical piece instead of an instrumental one. And when noticing the mixing up, mixing up she didn't stop. After the class, one student approached to her and told her how listening to that vocal piece crossed the line for her and how she hoped Rachel would not do it again. In the cases like these, Rachel uses her negotiation skills, humour and flexibility in order to be able to continue after the fall. She also finds peer support from the ultra-Orthodox teacher colleagues very important in, he, in her ab ability to deal with the borderline issues that come up in class. In the light of her accounts and her own description of herself as an insider-outsider, Rachel can be described as a boundary worker, a person who Ackermann and Bakker describe as, and I quote, a person who is crossing the boundary mostly alone, and who is building bridges between both worlds." End of quote. These persons are often held accountable in each world and face criticism from both sides. This kind of position at the boundary calls for self-confidence and willingness for dialogue, both the traits that Rachel see, uh, thinks that she possess, possesses. It can be argued that Rachel's flexibility and negotiation skills are mani manifestations of identity work at the boundary, constructed from intersecting identities that are constantly in flux. Thus, these intersecting identities can be seen as a source of boundary-crossing competence or intercultural competence, a set of skills and abilities that she needs when working at the boundary. Because of the segregation between the sexes in the ultra-Orthodox community, Rachel's classroom is reserved only for the women. She describes this as a beautiful place where so many things can happen, so that that is the place that I try to hold on to. In the process of boundary crossing, this kind of a third space um, is created in between the two existing activity systems as they interact thus revealing the ambiguous nature of boundaries. The boundary both divides and connects sides. However, the third space in between can also be seen as no one's land, a space where people at the boundary can step into and where all the, exciting practice, all the existing practices and conceptions from both sides can be left behind. According to Ackermann and Bakker, this stepping into the third space creates, and I quote, a need for dialogue in which meanings have to be negotiated and from which something new may emerge. End of quote. The presented findings of the analysis suggest that the theorization of boundary crossing is applicable when looking at the educational context from the perspective of identity formation. In this case, the perspective has been that of a teacher's, thus showing only one side of the story. The analysis can still provide us with information and experimental knowledge on the boundary work that is going on in a culturally complex situation, in this case, in the interaction between a religiously observant but liberal Orthodox Jewish female music teacher educator and religiously observant and traditional but heterogeneous group of ultra-Orthodox Jewish female teacher students. Thus, in the light of the findings of this case study, it can also be suggested that religion should be actively included in the areas of critical and culturally sensitive reflection in the study programs of higher music teacher education in order to prepare teacher students for cultural and religious diversity in class. In Rachel's case, despite the challenging circumstances of music teaching, that is, the strict religious rules and restric restrictions regarding behavior, <coughs> appearance, musical repertoire, and musical expression, there is still a connection between Rachel and the students that makes her return to Jerusalem and teach. Creating a third space at the boundary gives room for mutual learning, how to negotiate between different identities in a shared space. Ideally, 
this no negotiation of intersectionality can lead to a new in-between practice, boundary practice, where the principles of shared meanings and understandings can flourish, creating potential for true intercultural exchange within music education. Rachel sums up beautifully her view on how to be a boundary worker in that shared space. I believe that my job in any of the courses is that I'm a facilitator. What I want to facilitate when I'm in music teacher education is between the music teacher or musician and their own identity and their own practice and their culture. So I want them to find peace with what they are and who they are and where they are and what they are doing. I hope to be able to bring them to a point where they can say, I own my musicianship. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> now, yep. Floor is open for discussion at least for five minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, Jack. Uh, that, that was very nice. Thing. <laughs> but uh, I, I had a question if, if you if you do you think it, it plays a role that, that you were having this interview with Rachel which means you as someone who's coming from a place where pedagogy is of a certain level as it has mm. been shown and, and where civil rights are of a certain level as it has been shown and egalitarianism and so on so do you, do you take that into account or not, your position in interviewing her? Mm. That's, that's the first question. Second question, <laughs> have, have, you okay. her, have you observed her uh, at work? Mm, yes, I have. Okay. Just shortly. Uh, last time when I was uh, in Jerusalem, um, I, I, or I, I was in Tel Aviv, and uh, we took a short visit to Jerusalem, and we visited the, uh, the, the program. The, the ultra orthodox female pro program. So I've seen her there in action, but of course it was a, was a short time. It wasn't yeah. like many classes, but okay. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the first question. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, about yeah, the yeah, positions. Yeah, saying I am, I am a liberal, I am. Yes, a, yes. By, by yes. Or, I, I don't know. Yes, and I, I, I would actually like to uh, look further uh, at that uh, kind of position or role that she is taking mm. when she is saying these almost like statements, mm. statements of, of herself. So, um, yes, it's a, that's actually one, one really um, interesting um, thing that I would like to take a closer look at. Yeah. Because, um, of course, the, how, you, how you construct your own mm. identity you can do it in several yeah, yeah. ways, and of course, like by telling everyone that I am that and that and mm -hmm. that, that's the one kind of manifestation. Mm -hmm. But how, how do you really then, deep down inside, feel about that? Mm -hmm. Or is it just a role? Mm -hmm. Or, Of course, if we are like professionals, we are teaching professionally, of course our professional identity is some, kind of a role that mm -hmm. we take or we, you know, like a robe that we put on when we go to class. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, this, this study actually, it's, it's ongoing mm -hmm. and I have uh, interviewed her twice now and in the second interview I have, I, I tried to touch those, go deeper mm -hmm. to those like, um, those statements yeah, that yeah. she ca gave the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm still analyzing the, the second interview, so be something mm -hmm. will come up. Thank you. Okay, Thomas? Um, yeah, it was really fascinating. And I was just reminded of uh, some of the discourses that I've seen on Facebook <laughs> from colleagues in the US who uh, were these debates about issues of trigger warnings and stuff that mm -hmm. we've been um, going on. Yeah. So about the role of the teacher in higher education as uh, uh, obviously being a facilitator of learning and to try and push students beyond certain boundaries, but at the same time 
having to be very careful about those boundaries mm. and how the, the power of certain student bodies have now uh, um, led to these debates about students not wanting to be mm. triggered with certain mm. uh, issues, um, either personal or political. I wondered whether those discourses had also been uh, kind of articulated in your perspective. Yes, I think very much so, and I think that's a very important, actually very important uh, issue there, um, that kind of um, manifold kind of uh, position that teacher has to take when she goes into a um, classroom that, uh, that have students from different cultural backgrounds and also from the backgrounds that she doesn't represent herself. Um, and I think it comes up with, with Rachel as well, that she has, because she is an Orthodox Jew, she doesn't see herself as an outsider as such, uh, because she, it's, She's, she knows some of the she knows the, the traditions, but she doesn't herself maybe observe them all or, or um, the ultra orthodox are more maybe strict on some things that that she herself is um, but um, yes, that's a really the um, main actually main issue there. Um, in her way of being that kind of facilitator and how she has to also narrow her own identity down a little bit when she's there, but then she can't, cannot totally like um, um, to totally be someone else. So she, and she's a strong personality. She wants to bring herself and be honest with, with the students as well. So there's all the time this kind of interaction and negotiation going on in class. And as, as I was visiting the class, actually one of the classes that she teaches there, I was really taken by the, by the atmosphere. I thought beforehand when I went there, before I went there, I, I thought that it it would be really uh, like strict and like, uh, everyone would be really quiet and uh, like, okay, I can't say or do anything improper. But uh, it wasn't like that. It was really kind of, kind of free. <laughs> of course, within the, they were um, singing and um, uh, playing classical art music. But, you know, uh, within those limits or frame. It, it was kind of a really, really nice, uh, a nice uh, experience, actually. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And now, to our last speaker for this session.